Good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, the big learning event. And this is the keynote for Dr. Nathan Wolf. So if any of you are in the wrong room, you have to go across the street. But I'm sure none of you are in the wrong room. And um, looks like we have standing room only. Uh, but um, you could sit on the floor, too, in the front if you want to. I won't. This is Madison. Oh, yeah, if, if there is an empty seat next to you, please raise your hand. OK, so a few lucky people can go there. Now, we have been in this room uh, several times uh, this last semester as part of the incubator series of the Global Health Initiative. This is the initiative that was started by the chancellor and the provost. Uh, but uh, since the semester was over, in case any of you didn't notice, the Center for Global Health and the Global Health Initiative have merged into one big campus-wide uh, institute for global health. And this event hosting Dr. Nathan Wolf is our first real official um, debut of a, of a public appearance as the Institute for Sustainable Global Health. And um, it's really an honor to introduce to you uh, Nathan Wolf. Of course, I don't, I don't really recognize him the way you see him. Um, I knew Nathan many years ago when we were at Hopkins together. Uh, he was a postdoc. Uh, and he was uh, usually out in the field in Cameroon, and every now and then he would come back to Hopkins. Of course, he had uh, dreadlocks down to halfway down his back. Um, Nathan, I don't think you'd showered for several weeks whenever you... <laughs> and uh, he didn't really know what to do with hot water either. But um, that's, that's the Nathan I knew back then. Uh, he was just... had so much energy, he would be... Um, out in the field, and he'd come back to Hopkins, and he would be bored, because uh, he wanted to keep doing things. And, and he's a fabulous teacher, as you'll see, but he also wanted to change the world. And he wants to do everything. So he is doing everything. And I'm going to actually quickly read a little something. Uh, he, is, uh, he has an endowed professorship, uh, visiting professorship at Stanford University. Uh, and he's the founder and director of the Global Viral Forecasting Initiative. He received his doctorate in immunology and infectious diseases from Harvard, uh, the recipient of a Fulbright Fellowship, and he was also awarded the NIH's uh, International Research Scientist Development Award in 1999 and a prestigious NIH Director's Pioneer Award in 2005. Uh, he's published uh, lots of articles and chapters, uh, and I'm about to introduce his upcoming book that's coming out in October that um, I'm going to have to kill you all after I tell you that this, what this book's about. But um, uh, among his major findings are the discovery of the first uh, evidence of, of natural transmission of retroviruses from non-human primates into humans, and most recently, uh, he was in the Time Magazine uh, as the one, most 100, uh, the, within the 100 most influential people in the world. And when Mari Cotter showed me this article uh, of Nathan, that I quickly emailed him and I said, what took Time Magazine so long to discover you? Um, he's published everywhere, Nature, Science, uh, Lancet, uh, proceedings of the National Academy, JAMA, New York Times, Wired, Discovery, Scientific America, even Forbes. And I want to just tell you about this book that he's coming out with in October, so you have to wait. It's called The Viral Storm, The Dawn of a New Pandemic Age. And I'll just quickly tell you that in The Viral Storm, the award-winning biologist Nathan Wolf tells the story of how viruses and human beings have evolved side by side through history, how deadly viruses such as HIV, swine flu, bird flu, uh, almost wiped out um, civilization. Wolf's research mission in the jungles of Africa and the rainforest of Borneo have earned him the nickname, the Indiana Jones of virus hunters. <laughs> And here, Wolf takes readers along 
the groundbreaking and often dangerous research trips to reveal the surprising origins of the most deadly diseases and to explain the role that viruses have played in human evolution. In the world where each new outbreak seems worse than the one before, Wolf points out the way forward as new technologies are brought to bear and um, his provocative vision of the future will change the way we think about viruses and perhaps remove a potential threat to humanity's survival. So with that, I want to bring Nathan Wolf to the podium and please help uh, me, w help me uh, welcome him to M Madison to kick off our Institute for Global Health. Nathan, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jonathan, for the nice introduction. Uh, it's great to be with all of you this morning. I think we'll, wow, great crowd here. Um, we're going to make this sort of informal. And if anyone has sort of short clarification questions, feel free to, to ask me during the presentation. Uh, we'll also leave quite a bit of time at the end for uh, some serious discussion. Uh, I've known Jonathan for probably 12 or 15 years now. And I think all of you probably know him as a phenomenal sort of director of this program and an excellent teacher. So actually, I'm going to dive right in. And we're going to talk about, from my perspective, one of the most interesting and important pandemics uh, of our age, which of course is uh, the HIV AIDS pandemic. And, and the first question I'll ask you is to think to yourself, when you think about the beginnings of this pandemic, you know, if you ask most people in the world when they think about the beginnings of the AIDS pandemic, uh, perhaps in the States, Magic Johnson may come to mind, one of the first public figures that really talked openly about having AIDS. But certainly, you'll probably be thinking about the 1980s. OK, but I'm going to tell you, and most of you probably know this, that this is a virus that crossed from chimpanzee populations into humans probably in the late 19th or early 20th century, certainly by the time that this photo was taken in 1929 in Brazzaville. HIV already infected a whole range of human, human beings in, in sub-Saharan Africa. And, and this is something that's really, I think, for me, pivotally important. We should be asking ourselves as global health practitioners, whether we're veterinary students or public health students, or we're just basically interested in the nature of global public health, we should be asking ourselves, why is it the case that if this virus sort of crossed over so early, it took us until 1981, 30 years ago, to identify some of the symptoms associated with it. And we just recently passed the major milestone, the 30-year milestone of the identification of AIDS. Why did it take us so long to identify it? Um, and I think, in some ways, for me, this is one of the most profound questions in the field of public health. It's one of the central driving questions of my own mission as a scientist, which is, can we fundamentally change the nature of how we catch these things? Is it possible for us to sort of find these things and catch them before they spread? And, and I just like like you'd all think about for a moment, what if in 1959 we know definitively that there was a diverse population of HIV circulating in Central Africa? What if in 1959 we identified the virus? Let's say we changed the nature of the way that we addressed the pandemic, we discovered some of the ways that the virus was being transmitted. How could the world look different today than it did then? Perhaps we'd be publishing about HIV in journals of neglected disease, rather than thinking about it as one of the sort of profound pandemics of our time, something that sort of effectively tore a piece of skin out of our, our species. I mean, this was a very, very profound impact event for humans. And so I think you know, this is one of the important things we need to think about. You know, and so for me, when I think about sort of how we're going to be able to tackle this, if we're going to be able to do it, first of all, we're going to have to understand the nature of pandemics. Where do they come from? How do they work? And this is, this is something that I um, put together a few years ago with Jared Diamond and Claire Panosia and colleagues of mine at UCLA at the time to really think conceptually about where pandemics come from. At the end of the day, one of the fundamental features of pandemics that they really all share is that they all come from animals, okay? And this may not be surprising. If we look, if we really think about where's the diversity of viruses and other pathogens that are out there in the world, where are they actually, where do they reside? And the answer to that is by and large in animal populations, okay? So first of all, if, if we take a look at the mammal diversity on the planet, most of the mammals that are out there are wild mammals. 
A smaller percentage of them are domestic mammals. Now, we've interacted with those mammals for a long period of time. Many of the pathogens from those animals have already entered into human populations. So most of the new things that have the potential to infect us are out there in wild animals. And there really is sort of a process by which we interact with these. Okay? We're constantly coming into contact. There's plenty of interaction between humans and animal populations. If we think about this, last night I was hanging out with Jonathan and his dog Taz. And I, I saw Jonathan uh, playing with the dog, kissing the dog, hanging out with the dog. At that moment, Jonathan was sitting right here. Uh, he was experiencing at least a temporary transmission of some of those microbes in the dog's mouth. Okay? And this is something that all of you who have animals are experiencing, whether it's cats or dogs. You all are being at least sort of momentarily infected with the diverse assemblage of microorganisms that exist on those animals. Now, the good news is that most of these go nowhere. Okay? They really go nowhere. They'll infect one individual maybe for a few minutes, a fleeting momentary infection, and they'll go nowhere. Now, occasionally, these things do become transmissible. And so when we think about viruses like Ebola, for example, uh, Ebola, for me, is something that sort of reaches this level. It's something that crosses from animal populations into humans, and it actually transmits for at least a few generations. Now, that's where these things start to become scary. So people are asking me lately, of course, and many of you are probably getting queried about this, what's the nature of the E. coli outbreaks that are occurring. From my perspective, it's really interesting. It's something interesting to focus on. It's potentially highly disruptive, economically impactful. But until these things have the capacity to go from human to human, they're really not going to be global risks for the human population. It's really that moment when things have the capacity to move from one person to the other that they really sort of transcend localized events and have the capacity to infect us as a global population. And Ebola is sort of one of these things we need to watch. Um, we just have a finding which will come out probably in the next uh, six months or so, where we identified a novel strain of the Ebola virus in, some, some, uh, in an outbreak that we were investigating in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Now, this is something that we need to pay attention to, because there's a lot of diversity of these viruses out there. So even if history shows us that our previous outbreaks never went anywhere, that doesn't mean that future outbreaks are not going to spread and have a big impact on us. Okay, now then, a few of these things will go on to become adapted to human populations, and yet s still have sustainable reservoirs in animals. Um, a classic example of this would be, for example, dengue virus. Okay, so dengue continues to circulate in non-human primates in forested areas, and yet it also circulates in human populations. Only very rarely do things sort of reach this pinnacle that HIV has reached, where they become really solely transmissible human agents. Okay, now here's the interesting thing to think about from a policy perspective, though. Okay, where's the action in terms of biology? Okay, well, if you're really trying to figure these things out, this is where all this is occurring, these first few levels. Where is global disease control focused? Almost all of it is focused really at the top of the pyramid. Okay, and part of my argument to you is by the time something gets up here, largely it's too late. These things have spread around the world. They're already sort of ingrained in, the, in human cultures and human systems and human biology. It's going to be very, very difficult to address that. Certainly, HIV is a perfect example. So AIDS was identified in 81, 30 years ago. The virus was discovered in 83. And you had officials from uh, uh, Department of Health and Human Services that basically sat there with the scientists that announced the discovery of HIV. And they said, we're going to have a vaccine for you within a year. Don't worry about it. Okay? 30 years later, we're still waiting for a vaccine. And what I think is really key is that we start developing much more substantial biology and public health that works at this interface between human and animal populations. And this is basically what I've been focused on for the last 10 years of my life. Um, I like the term viral chatter. My mentor, Don Burke, who's now the dean of uh, the School of Public Health at University of Pittsburgh, came up with this idea. And viral chatter, you can think of it sort of like intelligence chatter. So if you imagine uh, Department of Homeland Security monitoring communications to see if there's going to be an interesting event out there, right? they might be, say, screening email messages. Okay, and maybe bomb itself will not be enough to trigger it. Maybe the name of a particular kind of plastic explosive combined with a geographic location may be triggering some of, their, some of their systems. And many of those are going to be false positives, and they never will lead to anything. But the point is you've got to follow off to some of these. And our idea is that maybe by following the viral chatter here, we can actually understand some of the patterns in these pandemics and potentially catch them before they spread. OK, and so what does this mean? If you're going to actually go to that interface and study the moment at which these pandemics are born, you're going to have to deal with people who have a tremendous amount of exposure to a diverse assemblage of wildlife. Okay, and for us, 
one of the populations we started with, and obviously the origins of HIV helped to guide us along this route, was some of these uh, hunting populations, people that hunt and butcher wild animals uh, in Central Africa. This is one of the individuals that we work with uh, in Cameroon. And I thought what it would be nice to do is to just, just to give you a sense of what the flavor of this work is to show you uh, some footage. Uh, Anderson Cooper from CNN came out to visit us. Let's see if I can get this started. Deep in a remote of region of Cameroon, this, this two hunters like. stalk their prey. Their names are Patrice and Petit. They're searching for bushmeat. Forest animals they can kill to feed their families. Patrice and Petit set out most days to go out hunting in the forest around their homes. They have a series of traps of snares that they've set up. And they'll catch wild pigs, snakes, monkeys, rodents, anything they can really. Patrice and Petit have been out for hours but found nothing. The animals are simply gone. We stop for a drink of water. Glamour shot. Then there's a rustle in the brush. A group of hunters approach. Their packs loaded with wild game. There's at least three viruses that you know about which are in this particular monkey. This species, yeah. And there's many, many more pathogens that are present in these animals. These individuals are at specific risk, particularly if there's blood contact, they're at risk for transmission and possibly infection with novel viruses. As the hunters display their kills, something surprising happens. They show us filter paper they've used to collect the animal's blood. The blood will be tested for zoonotic viruses, part of a program Dr. Wolf has spent years setting up. So this is from this animal right here, greater spot nose guanin. Every person who has one of those filter papers has at least at a minimum been through our basic health education about the risks associated with these activities, which uh, presumably from our perspective gives them the ability to decrease their own risk and then obviously the risk to their families, the village, the country, and the world. So I'm going to switch gears just a little bit now, and uh, I'm going to leave this image up for a second. Obviously, this is, this is a disturbing image uh, in a couple of different ways. But I think it's important. Look, this is a public health talk. Um, but as someone who spent uh, years living in these places and working with folks and dealing with this problem of bushmeat, I think it's worthwhile sort of saying so a little something about sort of bushmeat. So bushmeat is the term that's often used for the hunting of wild game. Okay. And at least for many of us in the States, growing up in the States, the way that we experienced this was as sort of a boutique conservation issue. Okay, we would see these images of a gorilla hand, you know, or of a, a hunter sort of shrouded in the corner, and we sort of got the sense of this is, this is something which is devastating. And the reality is, your sort of children and grandchildren are gonna come back to you and they're gonna say, look, you were supposed to be sort of custodians of the planet. You were supposed to shepherd the planet through the period of time that you lived on the planet. But really, in fact, one of the things you did was you allowed some of the most valuable rel or valuable close relatives, interesting animal diversity to basically go extinct on your watch. And that's absolutely true. Okay, we're living in sort of wonderful splendor with 34 kinds of beer and a wonderful um, sort of air conditioned space here, a hundred million dollar building. And basically because we can't provide for individuals, they're forced to do something which is an energetically really, really difficult to go out and hunt these animals. Okay, so that's fine. We're going to lose animal species. It seems like we've sort of written that off and that's just the, the way we're going to live. And I don't think we should do that, but I think that's sort of what, what we're doing. That's the trajectory we on, we're on. But when you think about bushmeat, it transcends this issue of conservation. Uh, in addition to being a, a phenomenal conservation problem, you're also setting up a major food security issue because you're setting up a situation where these are not sustainable resources for these populations. As these populations grow, they're basically going to burn through these animals, and they're going to be stuck without food sources. So we have to think about that. And then more on top of that, you know, your grandchildren, your children are going to be saying to you, look, you knew how HIV entered into the human population. You knew the capacity for this kind of contact to lead to the birth of novel pandemics. And yet you stood by and really did nothing about it. You know, and I think as we're thinking about this picture, certainly from, from a Western perspective, uh, part of what we think about is sort of who's to blame. Okay, and I'm going to tell you, so, th so the reason um, I showed that last picture 
is also to give you a sense. So, so that's, this is the individual who hunted that animal. And I think if you take a look at this picture and you get a sense of this individual, the notion somehow that this is the person that we should be blaming or that the responsibility for all these problems of food security, of pandemic prevention sort of rest on his shoulders is really absurd. I mean, ultimately, if we're going to be able to address this problem, we're all going to have to take it much more seriously. We're going to have to dive into it. We're going to have to address the issues of rural poverty in Central Africa, which is really off our grid. It doesn't seem like a profound problem. But what I'm telling you right now, it's going to lead to major, major problems. And it's going to be one of these defining moments and features of our particular moment in history. And it's something that we shouldn't neglect. Um, now, on to the, now on to the science. It, it, before I sort of dive into telling you a little bit of what we found, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to give you a case study of one particular site around the world that we've, we've worked in. And this is Cameroon. It actually happens to be the first place that I started to do this work. And I thought it's just fun to give you a sense. Um, so I started off with Don Burke. He recruited me while I was working uh, actually with Billy Karish, who many of you will know, the, the famous wildlife vet in, in Borneo. And I was working in Malaysian Borneo. And I used to occasionally sort of go in to check my email in the local village. And I got a message one day from my mother saying, uh, Nathan, there is a general from the US military who's trying to get in touch with you. I'm not sure what kind of trouble you're in out there. <laughs> but you better solve this. This is not a good reflection on our family. Um, and anyway, to make a long story short, it wasn't a general. It was a colonel. And it was Don Burke, who was in the military at the time. And he basically said, look, I want you to come and do work as a postdoc. I want you to start up uh, basically one of the first sites to, to really monitor these kinds of events in the world in Cameroon. And I said, great, you'll just have to wait for two years. Uh, I was very lucky. Don was willing to wait. Um, I, of course, is the perfect sort of naive postdoc. I came into the situation. I said, great, uh, we'll establish 17 sites in rural villages throughout Cameroon. We're going to collect viable functional lymphocytes. We'll collect uh, behavioral data. We'll look at animals and human populations. Um, and then, of course, this is what I found. Um, but here's the good news. And this is really what we found. And it, it's sort of, I approach this as a scientist. So I'm one of these, for, for any of you who saw my talk yesterday, I, I'm really a microbiologist. So I am in love with the unseen world of living organisms. I find these things absolutely amazing. I think the fact that we understand so little about them is one of the most interesting features of our sort of this moment in history. Um, you know, but one of the things that was amazing to me is to actually the, more of the sort of sociology of it is how you interact with folks and how you can really engage to do this kind of science on a global level. And the answer to how you solve these problems is people. And the good news is there are scientists and engineers and people who are engaged everywhere around the world, often in situations like Cameroon where they don't have a lot of resources that want to do this work. This is a perfect example of them. This is Ubal Tamofe, who I've been working now with for 12 years. Uh, he now runs our entire Central African program. And Ubald, of course, laughs at me when I show this picture because you can't see his face. Uh, this is a picture of us working in a very remote area. This was in Ajala, which is in the very far southeastern corner of Cameroon. It takes us about 48 hours of constant driving to get specimens back, which is just the amount of time you have to, in order to preserve sort of the functional lymphocytes that we were trying to get at this point. And of course, we come back with these specimens, having convinced people in these rural villages to give us their blood, which is not an easy task. And we, we run across this jackknife truck. But the reason I show this picture of Ubald is because you can, you can tell by his posture that he's about to solve this problem. Um, and he did. He, he absolutely did. He, so somehow, really, I don't know, how, however many of you have worked in these parts of the world, the amazing thing is no matter where you are, you run into like a, a, a ditch or something like this, or you have a problem, people will, are, will emerge. They're, they're there. And, they'll, and they're just sitting there, and they're happy to help you. You know, and Ubald's really just the start of it. I've run into some of the most, and this is one of the fun things about this book was being able to sort of tell the story of some of these people. This is Paul DeLong Minutu. He's literally among the most effective communicators I've ever run into in my life. Uh, and I'll say when I arrived in Cameroon, I didn't speak a word of French. And I could tell even immediately without speaking French that he was an excellent communicator. He had been a health journalist. So basically, his role in Cameroon was, um, he was sort of the Sanjay Gupta of Cameroon, basically providing all of the medical news. He was the health correspondent. Now, the amazing thing, so we figured he retired, and we said, hey, join our project. Because one of the challenging uh, bits of this research is you go into these villages, and people think you're crazy. We've hunted and butchered animals all of our lives, and our family did too. 
I mean, and, and there is sort of an interesting point here, which is worth taking a second on. This is really a tragedy of the commons sort of situation. It's not that any single one of those hunting interactions is high risk. Although, I do say to them, look, if it was my sister, and if it's people in my lab, we take universal precautions. So we assume all these things have Ebola and HIV. But the reality is that they're right. When, you, when you're when you dealing with malaria risk, when you're dealing with malnutrition as a risk, when you deal with like quality of water, I mean, the, really, these folks, high on their list is not safe food safety. It's not really high on their list. And the problem really is more when you add up thousands and hundreds of thousands of people engaged in these activities. From a planetary perspective, it becomes really substantial. But anyway, we have to come in and explain them what we're doing. We don't want to take their blood for some sort of nefarious purpose. We're not trying to make a million dollars off of them. I mean, this is really, we're, we have good purposes, and having these folks is key. And it was absolutely amazing. We would show up in these villages, and uh, many of these villages, there was no television, so people had never seen Paul DeLong. They had experienced really no television in their lives. And so they didn't recognize his face, but as soon as he spoke, they immediately recognized his voice. Uh, and he was a trusted figure, and he helped to sort of make this sort of thing work. And this has become, again, the reason I show you this about Cameroon is it's become a model for us of how we've deployed this sort of system throughout the world. Um, a couple of fun before and after shots. Uh, one of the great things about doing this work is you really get to be able to change some of the infrastructure. Uh, th this is what our laboratory looked like, a wonderful old colonial German building. So the Germans actually occupied uh, Cameroon for about three or four years before World War I. They really, you could tell by the way they built these buildings, they were expecting to be there for hundreds of years. I mean, these are the strongest, most incredible buildings, but obviously very dilapidated at the point we started. Um, now we have a, a facility where we have separate human and animal capacity. Um, we, we, are, we are able to do uh, PCR. We, we look for the near neighbors of a whole range of human pathogens. So a lot of our viral discovery, a lot of our disease discovery, and really some of the, uh, most of the very best laboratories uh, sort of that I work in are actually our field laboratories. Okay, and so this is what we've done there. So before and after shots, um, you know, when you arrive, this is reminiscent of last night. Um, basically, in order to keep the cold chain, you have to figure out a way to, to um, get dry ice to start with. Ultimately, you want liquid nitrogen. So to get dry ice, the people who produce the most dry ice as a byproduct are the breweries. Okay, so you can imagine going, doing this is sort of challenging. It, it's a pain. And by the time you actually leave, you're not really in the state to do much in the way of research. <laughs> um, but you know, over time, if you really push on these things, and it's not easy to get funding, but if you really focus on it, you can do amazing things. We now have liquid nitrogen generators in many of our sites. The, this is a piece of equipment that costs $100,000, but it produces endless cold chain. And it's something which is sustainable, because many other people throughout this region want, you know, they need nitrogen. Before and after shot of me, this is a shot of me, um, hanging out with Colonel Impudi, who is my Cameroonian mentor. Uh, sort of really Don Burke's equivalent. He was the head of Walter Reed, uh, focused on HIV in Cameroon. Um, this is the after shot of me. Um, no comments. Um, just so you know, this is, a, this is a picture of Don Burke, and this is uh, Ubal Tamofe from the front. Um, don't try this stuff at home. Okay, so what did we do? Summary slide. Okay, and this is just our work in Cameroon. But over the course of five or ten years, you can collect massive amounts of specimens, okay? And I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about our strategies for collecting these specimens. But we have some of the most extensive collections of animal specimens, animal blood specimens, in Africa, if not really in the world, um, by really, really hammering in and working with this. We identify novel microbes. We've seen absolutely new things. And then most excitingly from our perspective is we've watched the chatter. We've actually watched the process of these viruses jumping from animal populations into humans and actually watching them stick. And that's something that from our perspective we weren't expecting to necessarily see over the first five or 10 years. And we, and, but we found not only did we see it, but we saw a lot of evidence of it. And uh, again, this is just to tell you, you know, show you a little bit of our collections. I'm not gonna get into huge detail on this slide. But this is also just to remind me that, you know, for us, we do very much repository-oriented work. This is not work that historically has been well-funded by the NIH or seen as being important. From our perspective, if you're studying organisms you know really well, then you better do hypothesis-driven science and really nail down in sort of typical NIH style. If you're studying the unknown world, you're out there exploring. You're basically, if you're collecting and you're creating museums, that's like what we did in 17th, 18th century when it came to mammals. 
And that's what sh we should be doing now when it comes to microbes. The notion that the NIH is going to push us into like having to create a hypothesis for doing research in Cameroon is crazy. Now, and I have to say, NIH has supported me very generously, but mostly through the Pioneer Award, which basically says we can't fit you. We think what you're doing is useful, but we can't fit you into our standard system, so we have to fund you outside of it. Well, I'm saying right now we should be doing exploration. We should be doing collections. And for me, these are living collections. And so any scientists out there that want access to these collections, just talk to us and ask us. Um, we want to provide access to these. And what we're doing increasingly is trying to create mechanisms that will help people to share these specimens um, and, and know what's out there. Because there's a lot of specimens out there we're not familiar with. Um, this needs to be updated. But this is a couple of interesting agents that we've discovered. Um, you know, for us, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about this in more detail. I'm actually going to talk about this in more detail. Let's keep moving. Um, one of the, for us, one of the first things we saw, and this was really, it, it was really, uh, it, it was great and it was interesting. I lost a beer bet with Don, which happens to me all the time. Um, beer really seems to be a common theme in this talk, doesn't it? <laughs> um, so Don, and, which is really great, I, I encourage you guys to do this with your students or with your mentors and professors. You make beer bets about things that you believe or don't believe. And in my case, look, I was really excited about the possibility that we would catch, say, retroviruses crossing from animals into humans. But I thought that this, while this occurred, it was a fairly low frequency event. Don said, go look, you'll find it. I was, in my mind, I was sort of like, yeah, he just wants me to go spend three or four years setting up a site. But we looked, and I remember actually the first time we saw it is that this particular virus, Simeon Fomi virus, is a fascinating virus for this kind of work because uh, it's co-speciated. In other words, each particular species of non-human primate has their own particular Simeon Fomi virus. And interestingly, humans don't have that. And I've, I've sort of speculated as to why that may be the case in the book. But the interesting thing from a research perspective is if we see these viruses in humans, we can, just by sequencing the virus, figure out which animal it came from. Okay, and we did this with Fomi virus, and I remember sitting in Bill Switzer's lab in the CDC, and I remember seeing the first evidence of this and just being amazed at it. And the reality is we went on very quickly to see, even by 2004, now we've seen about nine of these viruses that have jumped over, three different viruses from three different animals that had crossed over into our hunters. Then we went back, of course, and looked at the behavioral data. And the behavioral data was great in the sense of what it showed us was that um, while many of the people in these communities were exposed to these animals through hunting and butchering, because we found communities that that's, those are the activities that occurred, it's very rare to actually hunt gorillas. It's, you got to be a little bit cautious if you're hunting gorillas. It's a specialized activity. Again, what I'm going to be talking to you about today, don't, don't try this. Um, and it was perfectly consistent. Our behavioral data fit perfectly with the molecular epidemiology. So in other words, we were actually seeing cross-species transmission. And so that was really exciting. Now, of course, with Fomi virus, we don't know if this is spreading and causing disease. Whenever you find a near neighbor of one of the important pathogens of humans, like for example, this is a near neighbor of HIV, of course you want to follow it and see what's going on. But we had no reason to suspect that this was spreading or causing disease. The two things that are necessary to really be scary. So then what we did is we looked at another age, another retrovirus. And this is one that was a little bit, it, 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 once we knew that it was occurring, it was like everything was game. And I said to myself, look, OK, you have, uh, HCLV1 and HCLV2, these were the two viruses, the two first retroviruses that were discovered. Uh, and in fact, HIV was originally caused, called HTLV3, if you remember, um, because it was the third retrovirus that was really discovered. Um, and what we know about HTLV1 and HTLV2 is just like HIV, both of these viruses are related to primate viruses. And HTLV1 and HTLV2, even if you haven't heard about them, these are important global pandemic viruses infecting about 20 to 25 million people around the world and causing lots of disease. These are non-trivial viruses. And that what we knew is that there were these uh, animal viruses that were closely related to HTLV-1 and HTLV-2. And we also knew that there was a group of animal viruses out there, STLV-3, and there was no human equivalent to it. So basically, to make a long story short, we went out and just screened through these people who had appropriate exposure to see if we could find this virus in them. And lo and behold, we did find evidence of HTLV-3, what's now called HTLV-3, Follow-up studies by our French colleagues and us have now found, I think, about seven, eight, or nine of these different viruses. So these are viruses which actually are crossing, at least on a fairly regular basis, may very well be spreading. Interestingly for us, though, we found a completely novel HTLV, which we've called HTLV4. And now what we've been doing is going back and screening through our primate collections to see if we can find this. Now again, if we stop and think about this, and this goes back to my broader point when I showed you the pyramid figure, which is 
at the end of the day, we should really be thinking about how these things cross over into human populations. And for us, we went out and in the first 1,000 people we screened, we actually found no completely novel viruses. Okay, so that means if we actually go out there and look, we're going to see a whole range of these viruses crossing over into human populations. Okay? And, and I, I think this sort of is really important to point out, but needless to say, these viruses, you know, sort of what happens in Central Africa doesn't stay in Central Africa. Okay? So you have all sorts of mechanisms now which are bringing these viruses into cities. And then I think if there's one slide which is the most important slide, this would really be it. Okay? We live in this profoundly interconnected space as human populations right now. And this is really sort of unprecedented in the history of really, I would say, animals on this planet, certainly terrestrial animals on this planet. The way that we are in interconnected and our capacity to move massive amounts of animals and plants and humans large distances creates what I think of as this sort of giant viral mixing vessel. Okay, so what we're doing, and when you see things like these complex recombinants that we have the capacity to find, whether it's E. coli recombination or recombinants between flu variants, which is basically inevitable, part of what we're doing is we're just creating the situation where we're mixing these things up, and the consequences are going to be massive, and it's not just for human populations, right? So again, it's all about low-hanging fruit. You, you for, obviously, you get out there and it's like, look, we, we're going to be attacked by some pandemic at some point in the future. We should think of this as an enemy, and we should try to figure out a way to stop it. But it's also going to go from humans to animals. And if you think about animal populations, increasingly, um, wild animal populations are in small forest islands or small island habitats surrounded by human populations. Humans are picking up agents from all around the world, moving them everywhere. The perfect example of this is the chytrid fungus, which I won't talk too much about. But it's devastated frog populations. I think there's now like tens of, of frog species that have gone extinct by basically us moving, the, moving this frog fungus around the world. Okay, this is something that didn't happen in history and it's going to keep happening. This is just, we're, we're just beginning this sort of period where we're going to see a lot of this sort of thing. So um, once we saw that we could actually do this work in Cameroon, we sat down and we basically said, hey, let's, uh, let's, let's go after some serious funding and let's try to deploy this system and create these sort of listening posts around the world. Let's extend it beyond an academic project and say we should be monitoring populations around the world to actually catch these things when they jump over. Uh, we went to a number of sources. NIH provided the seed funding through the Pioneer Award, and then Google.org and School Foundation both contributed $11 million that allowed us to really start moving on this. Uh, we went from an office of two individuals when I quit my job at UCLA to sort of do this work full time. Uh, it was a tenured position. Everyone thought I was an absolute lunatic. I'd worked you know, most of my academic life to actually get that position, and then two years after I had it, I was, have a nice day. Um, but the, the exciting thing is, is this is what we've done over the last couple of years. We now have uh, 25 people who work in our headquarters. We support uh, close to 100 individuals working around the world. We have projects in uh, over 20 countries and work with a dozen different laboratories around the world to actually start doing this work. Now, I should emphasize, this is really just, we're just getting rolling on this work. We need people, that's really the key. Really good scientists, we're always recruiting for excellent scientists. We sort of run what in some ways you could think of as sort of a microbiology workshop or hacker shop, in the sense that people come with crazy projects. I have, I have literally a data hacker who's working now 24 seven with like a team of folks that he's hired to basically crawl the internet and see signals of outbreaks that are occurring in digital space. Um, and we obviously need more resources, but we're doing this work. And we're doing it everywhere, because this is not something that's unique uh, to, to Central Africa. Populations throughout the world have contact with animals that are going to lead to these new pandemics. And what we do is we create these longitudinal studies where we enroll individuals who are really sort of highly exposed to these animals and follow them over time. Uh, we use these sort of blood spots. This was a, a, a great, I wish I had uh, a lot more time to chat with you folks. I think I'm probably, uh, I, I'm going to start moving a little bit more quickly through these, these slides so we have time to chat. But, Matt LeBreton, who's an ecologist I ran into early on in Central Africa, he was a, basically a herpetologist. He loved snakes. He was the snake guy. And what he would do is he'd drop off these pots of preservative, formalin, in these communities, because basically humans all throughout the world, our first instinct when we see snakes is just to kill them. Sort of kill them first and ask questions later, even though most of them probably are not deadly. And then he said, look, just throw the snakes into this pot of formalin, and I can do a diversity study. And I remember meeting him and saying, like, look, we, could we should develop a passive way to acquire blood specimens. 
And the amazing thing is these little, these filter papers, and you saw this in the video with, uh, with Anderson Cooper, um, basically we can provide these to populations who have this high exposure, and they'll take a few blood spots on these filter papers and basically just dry them out. And we regularly find new, we can't do as well with the RNA, sadly, off of these things, but we can get tons of DNA. So any DNA organisms, whether it be viral, parasitic, um, bacterial, we can find. We find plenty of new, new, new agents right off these blood spots. Uh, of course, we have to supplement this with active collections, high quality collections of key pivotal species so we can really, really get good specimens, whether it be bats or chimpanzees. Um, and then, and, and this is, look, this is really some of the exciting work that goes on. Uh, and there's a lot of folks, Yoshi, Tony Goldberg, uh, other folks that are in this community that are doing some amazing work. I mean, we really have this sort of unprecedented moment in history where not only have we uncovered this massive sort of unseen world, an unknown world of microorganisms that are the dominant features of life on our planet, but we have the tools necessary to explore them. This is a viral microarray, one of the things developed by Joe DeRisi, but now used by a number of folks around the world. We've got, a, this is an, a shot of an old 454. People who know these machines will laugh at me, but a year or two ago when I put this deck together, this was the cutting edge in viral discovery. So we actually sort of existed this interesting moment, and I was alluding to this earlier, I really feel like the way to think about this is sort of contemporary sort of viral repositories and museums, where we can go out and sort of document the un unknown world. And, and I think it's sort of exciting when we talk to our students, um, one of the things we need to be emphasizing to them is, look, we do not live in a world where everything is known, okay? Fine, if your objective is to find a new primate species, you may have to find, spend your whole life in some remote corner of Vietnam to find a new species of primate. But if you wanna explore and find new forms of life, you could find them right here on your hand. We understand just the tip of the iceberg of the microbial diversity, and we have the capacity to do this. So we, we could have a real renaissance now of the sort of science of exploration, but it would have to be the, the microbial world. Um, oh good, I've got five minutes left. I love that. Um, so in addition to look, look, scientists sort of, we all need sort of fuel, and all of us have different kinds of fuel, stuff that we find really fun. It's fun to discover these things, but one of the things about them is can you answer important historical questions? There's some really interesting academic questions and intellectual questions we want to get to. One that was important for me was the origin of malaria. I thought it was bizarre as a doctoral student. I spent time hanging out with uh, William Collins at CDC, sort of an expert in primate malarias, and I remember just sitting down and talking to him and saying, like, we really don't know where malaria came from, do we? And how is it possible as sort of the, the very fancy, developed, sophisticated species that we consider ourselves, that one of the most profoundly important agents to affect us in history, I mean, pop, we have human populations around the world have genetic evidence of the impact this parasite has had on the selection of our species, and yet we don't know where the thing came from. And so at the time we started this work, when I sat down with Bill Collins, he said, look, well, there's, we know that chimpanzees and gorillas, we know that wild apes have a parasite which is very close to falciparum. Okay? And so from that, we can conclude that there must be one of three different things going on. Either this is a parasite that was in the common ancestor of humans and chimps, you know, eight million years ago before our lineages diverged, and over time the thing sort of separated. Perhaps it's a human parasite that went into ape populations. This was a very popular hypothesis at the time. Obviously, sort of your intuition would be there's so many people around the world who have this particular parasite. And you know, how many have we found in apes? Like one or two, there's only one isolate out there. Maybe that's the case. The other possibility was it was an ape parasite that had jumped into humans. Now the interesting thing, and the reason we couldn't solve the problem is we had only one isolate of the chimpanzee parasite. So there's an easy solution to that. Go out and collect more specimens from, and that was exactly what happened in our studies, is we got more of these specimens, and so we were able to do this proper study. And if you look at the diversity of human falciparum, um, this is basically malaria. This, we have four different parasites, but this is the one we think of as malaria, the one that really harms us. And if you look at the diversity that's present in ape populations, boom, no ambiguity. This is clearly an ape parasite that jumped into human populations. Uh, this is work that we did a couple years ago, and it was followed up by some excellent work that Beatrice Hahn did. And now it looks very clearly like this is a gorilla parasite that jumped into human populations. Of course, we also, it's very interesting to look at some of the epidemiological features about this. This is uh, Anne Ramoyne's work. Anne is a, an excellent um, epidemiologist at UCLA who's devoted herself to really spending time doing active disease surveillance in some of the most remote areas of the planet in the Democratic Republic of Congo. 
And she's seeing this app. We've, we've done this work collaboratively. And one of the things that, that she saw, and we ended up uh, sort of working on together and publishing last year, was this amazing thing. So basically, it's the exploitation of humans as a niche by these viruses. Okay, so basically, historically, what you had is you had smallpox. And smallpox was sufficiently in human populations that it protected us from other sorts of pox viruses out there, right? So if you get smallpox, you then you either die or you become immune to future pox virus infections, at least orthopox virus infections. So we never got monkeypox. Then we had vaccinia. We had the vaccine for smallpox. But then once we eliminated smallpox and we stopped the vaccination, you had this young group of people that basically came out with no orthopox and they started getting monkeypox. And monkeypox is spreading, but it's spreading in this bizarrely interesting way, exactly in relation to the people who are born after the point that we stopped smallpox vaccination. So it's just like this beautiful epidemiological finding. It's really cool. And then one of the cool things we're doing right now, uh, Karen Saylors, who's a medical anthropologist on our team, is really saying, look, why don't we just start trying to see if we can't prevent these things? We know enough. Look, it's fun to do prediction. And we're going to obviously have to do that for ages. But we can go out there and start trying to see if we can change these behaviors. And with funding from USAID in collaboration with the group at AED, we're actually going out and seeing if we can change behaviors. And just to show you one sort of fun example of that, uh, you know, the idea is perha perhaps to do some domestication of these cane, these sort of, uh, uh, these are grass cutters. So this is a large and very tasty rodent, um, which you can actually domesticate and try to provide in some of these villages as an alternative to bushmeat. And this is particularly for the urban markets that are, are purchasing bushmeat from these communities. And, th and then some of the really exciting stuff we're doing as well is focusing on uh, the, the sort of proliferation of technology. It's sort of, it, we really live at this amazing moment in history where sort of we have the tools to document the diversity of these microorganisms, but we also have these new tools that will help us to understand the nature of human illness. So cell phones, I mean, right now, you think of the thing in your pocket, perhaps, if you're a little bit old school, is primarily something that you can use to communicate with other people by voice. If you're a little bit more contemporary, you think of it as something that can help you to access data. But from my perspective, all of you have basically locator beacons in your pockets, because those things are telling cell towers and telecoms exactly where you are at every single moment. They're providing mechanisms. And who's to say that we can't determine illness based on that? Okay, mobility patterns. Okay, so let's say we look at Madison. Every day at 2 AM, where are the majority of individuals? Okay, they're sleeping. Every day at 2, you know, Monday through Friday at 2 PM? Well, maybe, maybe I don't know, I shouldn't say Madison. I don't know. Let's say 3 AM. Um, OK, and then where are people at 2 PM or 3 PM, Monday through Friday? By and large, they're at work. Okay, this is not a perfect pattern, but we could see patterns. You know, and if you follow this through flu seasons, my prediction is that over time you'll be able to see little dips where people are ill and they're staying home during the day if you actually monitor this data. So we need to keep our minds open, and that's sort of what we do um, at, at sort of my, my little hacker workshop, GVFI, that I, that I have in San Francisco, is we keep our minds completely open. What's the best way to identify these outbreaks? And that's basically what we should be doing. Um, Jonathan talked about my book. It was great fun to do this book. And just to give you a few words on it, um, the first third of it is basically to think about sort of our history. What, what in our history helped us, sort of made us relate to microbes in ways that led us to the situation we're in? One of the amazing things that I spent a lot of time talking about is humans actually went through a near extinction event about 70,000 years ago. So about 70,000 years ago, we were an endangered species. And nobody's really stopped to think about what are the consequences of that for microbes. One of the consequences is we lost a lot of our microbial diversity, and we lost a lot of our defenses in terms of being able to battle those microbes. And then what happened next was we had this major interconnectivity revolution, where suddenly we're like thrown at light speed into this connection situation where we're all amazingly connected to each other. So the second third of the book talks about how we got to this situation and where we're going. And the final book, the final section actually goes back. This is the original GIS. This is John Snow's map where he first identified sort of cases of, you know, the, basically the, the origin of cholera by looking at water sources and ended up, you know, sort of famously shutting down one of the, um, one of the wells uh, in this area that was afflicted of cholera in London. And, and basically, the third part is to go back to this figure right here, which is to say, what is our contemporary GIS? 
How do we pull together all these different sources of information? If Jon Snow was alive today, he would be having a field day. He'd pull together cell data information. He'd look at the diversity of microorganisms, the host diversity. He'd be looking at connectivity patterns and social graphs. And he'd be able to understand in a really profoundly different way what the nature of our risks were. So we're in this situation, yes, we have some of the, the most intense risks ever in the history of organisms on our planet for pandemics, but we also have an unprecedented set of tools that can allow us to address us. The real question is, are we going to step up to this challenge and are we going to deal with it? And I will leave you on just sort of an interesting uh, note, my, one of my favorite stories from the book. Um, part of the fun thing about the book was just going in and sort of really exploring some of these amazing historical characters, um, both sort of famous and infamous. This is an infamous one. And this is sort of the story of interconnectivity. One of the chapters focuses on medical technology, um, it very much in the context of, yes, it does you know, great benefits, overwhelmingly huge benefits, but it's also connected us in ways that facilitate the transmission of diseases. So this is a fellow named Sergei Voronov. He was a Russian. Uh, he was a, a, the descendant of a sort of fam a vodka family, so he inherited a vodka fortune, but he decided he wanted to be a surgeon. This is the early 20th century, like 1900, 1905. He left to go work with one of the famous surgeons of his time. At the time, they were just starting to do transplants, and the fellow that he worked with in Paris had won a Nobel Prize for transplanting um, blood vessels. You know, it was the first thing they started to transplant. He said, wow, this is amazing. I want to do this. He went off to study with the king of Egypt and to be the physician for the, for the not to study with him, but to be the physician for the king's court in Egypt. And he saw this amazing thing to him. He said, you know what? The eunuchs in the court, they seem to age really quickly. They seem to age much more quickly, so maybe there's something in this. And so the guy had this bizarre idea, and what he started doing is transplantation studies where he would take the testes from uh, young, you know, young rams and put them into adults and see if there was an effect on changing the way that they aged. And he claimed that there was a huge effect. Then what he started to do is saying, OK, let's go and see if we do this with human populations. OK, this is something you probably have never heard about. But in the first 20 years, the 20th century, this man took testicles, testes from chimpanzees and baboons and put them into 2,000 humans including possibly Picasso. That's a little bit ambiguous, but certainly there was like a Nobel laureate in poetry that received it. This was the Viagra of the early 20th century. Okay? And if you stop and think about it, though, this is really messy. You talk about that viral mixing. That's a really <laughs> profound sort of viral mixing. And this was fun. There's a lot of stories like that. So uh, when the book comes out in the fall, we'll let you folks know. And if you're interested, uh, grab a copy. I'm supposed to say that. Um, <laughs> If you're interested and you want to check out our organization, Global Viral Forecasting, check us out. Um, we, we're doing, I mean, for me, it's really amazing. The group of people that have been able to pull together to do this work is really, really incredible. For those of you who sort of uh, really are engaged in this work and have an extraordinary desire to, to do things that are cutting edge within microbiology that can do something useful for the planet, please give us a call over time, whether it's now or in five years. Uh, we are constantly recruiting. Thank you very much for being a great audience. I think we still have some time for question and answer. Uh, thank you very much. Nathan, thank you so much. Uh, and I'm sure that stimulated some thought in the audience. And can, looking at it, how many of you are out there, uh, we are open for questions. Uh, just raise your hand. We've got uh, roaming microphones, and uh, we've got at least uh, 15, 15 minutes or so. So any questions out there? You're welcome to come to either mic stand, or if you're in the middle, we can try to navigate to you. Ah, uh, yes. So, OK. Sorry, Jake. So we have microphones here. We don't have roaming mics then, right? So come up to a microphone on either side and uh, ask away. Uh, hi. So you put up your chart that showed these different phases, mm -hmm. and one of them was uh, transmissibility. And um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the fact that transmissibility is not some, it, that's not going to be some sort of fixed in stone thing. That's going to be based on t culture, technology, changes in human biology, mm -hmm. other issues, and what thought you've given that. Well. I mean, also, I might refer, refer you to my... Identify yourself, just identify yourself. Sure. I'm Scott Swanson. I work in Jamie Thompson's regenerative medicine lab upstairs. Cool. I mean, among other things, I might refer you to, to my colleague Yoshi in the audience. Yoshi, do you want, can you raise your hand? 
who's just one of the experts in this particular. I mean, look, this is one of the fundamental questions we have. There's two variables that I think are most important when we're thinking about the potential for an agent to become a pandemic. Transmissibility, first and foremost, and obviously disease. If it doesn't cause any disease, if it goes pandemic, in some ways it doesn't really matter. Um, and I'm happy to talk about H1N1. H1N1 is not an example of that. H1N1 um, you know, killed a, a remarkable number of individuals, tens of thousands of individuals. Okay, so this, is not a tr this was not a trivial event. But anyway, like something like TTV, for example, that infects 30% of the population, doesn't cause disease, really who cares? Transmissibility, we don't, and the interesting thing is whether it's disease or transmissibility, we don't actually understand perfectly the variables that go into those features. We don't know what it actually takes to become transmissible. You know, and some of this work, for example, the work that Yoshi's doing on flu is helping us to really hammer in on what are the molecular mechanisms, at least in one particular tax of influenza viruses, on transmissibility. But this is ultimately what we need to do. And I think there's some really exciting uh, progress being made. There's a very interesting program that DARPA put out. Many, uh, I, I'm sure, you folks are familiar with DARPA, I'm sure. But anyway, so DARPA put out this program called Prophecy, which is really, can we predict the sort of the evolution of viruses? And this is where we need to be going. What kind of assays will we have where we can take a virus and basically put it into the assay or a series of assays to determine the transmissibility? I don't, we don't have an easy answer for that now. But certainly, over the next five or 10 years, I think this is going to be a very active area of science. And I think you can think about ways that you would do this. In a very primitive way, from my perspective, I'd be, I'm very interested in host range. So you could imagine a cell culture system where you had you know, um, my buddy Steve Quake, who's this amazing bioengineer at Stanford, has developed these, these sort of microfluidic systems that are for cell culture. So you can do basically 96 wells of different cell cultures in a little chip. You put something into it and see what happens. So you could imagine different species of animal cell cultures in those chips. Take an adenovirus and see what its diversity of animals it can infect in, and what are the diversity of host types, of tissue types that it can affect. Those things may help us to guess at the transmissibility features of these things. But I mean, it may just be a hard challenge. There's such a diversity of these microorganisms that there, it may be the case that there's simply no consistent series of, of things that needs to happen for transmissibility for all of them. We may have to go tax it by tax and establish them. It's a good question. Um, I think this is a logistical question, but why were you not collecting species in India? No, well, part of it is just, look, we would collect species. India is absolutely key, and we have a lot of colleagues that are working in India. We've started work in Pakistan. We work closely with groups that are working in Bangladesh. Uh, there's no re good reason for it. I mean, India is perfect in some ways, right? So what you're looking for is ultimately the most interesting situations are going to be high animal diversity, high contact with human populations, and critically proximity to large population centers. You know, so certainly India. We work very closely with colleagues in China. We have a site in China and permanent presence there in in Guangzhou. So you're right. I mean, it's a perfect place to work. We just haven't started there yet. Nathan, I'm Hanyap. I'm with the USGS National Wildlife Health Center. Um, how much, what's the proportion of your collection that is on blood cards versus whole blood? Yeah. Because I'm really concerned about, so I like the bias against RNA viruses on blood cards. Yeah. That technology is just, especially in, in difficult, you know, environments. RNA is just not stable, and yep. clearly those are the major group of viruses that we would want to be going after, right? Yeah, no, I think it's a good question, and I think this is the kind of questions that sort of museums always historically have had to ask. So our philosophy has been, let's collect as much as we can and the best we can, and, and not pretend that we're collecting completely unbiased specimens, even the way that we're sampling, right? Using hunters to sample is very biased. Using these blood cards is going to bias us in terms of what we find. So that's absolutely the case. We've addressed it in a couple of ways. We're still continuing to push these companies to develop better cards. Uh, we've been testing some preservatives that we actually place on the cards. We do like the typical nucleic acid preservation stuff, like we'll take like guanidinium thiocyanate and actually soak the cards in it. Uh, and we think this is probably going to increase our RNA yields a little bit. But I mean, that's just life. Basically, we do, um, we do have biases. That's, that's just the way that it is, number one. But number two, in some ways, the science is not quite caught up to us yet. I mean, it will be great, and I believe within five to 10 years, we'll be able to take a drop of blood and actually document all the viruses in that drop of blood. But whatever group tells you that we're there yet, they're lying. Basically, you can't do that yet. 
You know, and it's, I, I, this is really, if you ask me sort of what is the cutting edge of science in this work, uh, I would say bioinformatics is one of these areas because for those of you who have used these, the, these amazing techniques, I showed you the 454 machine, you know, and there are really magicians out there. There's probably half a dozen or a dozen of them that are, um, and Tony Goldberg has been playing in this space as well, where they basically are taking specimens and basically just sequencing the hell out of the specimens and seeing what is the diversity of nucleic acids in a particular specimen, and even doing it to a certain extent quantitatively. The problem with those is what they call the blast-proof data. So you go through and, yeah, fine, you find that maybe 20% of your specimen is the DNA of your host and the RNA of your host. That's great. There's other things you can identify, some garden variety organisms or things we know. There's some things that are new, but there's a massive amount of that data, sometimes 20, 30, 40%, depending on what tissue you look at, that sequence data that we basically don't know what it is. We can't match it up to anything that exists out there, and we basically don't know what's there. And I think that will be some of the really exciting science of the future, is to sort through. Certainly some of that is just artifact, right? Each of these techniques is going to lead to artifacts. Some of it is junk, but some of it is not junk. Some of it is unknown organisms that we simply can't identify yet. Uh, and it's, the data is just sitting there, so it's sort of a, it's a great sort of big data problem and a really fun problem. So it's something we're starting to pursue, actually. If I can just add uh, with Dr. Ip's uh, question that uh, he's from the National Center for Wildlife Health, and that's based here in Madison. For those of you on campus that don't know that, uh, Madison is the place to be to do zoonotic disease. And thanks for your, your question, Han. Go ahead. I understand that the oceans are a vast reservoir of viruses. And I was wondering if you could say what role ocean viruses have do we have to worry about them? You know, I'm sure that they must. This is like, I mean, Jonathan or Rita Colwell might be interesting people to talk about this. Certainly there are some things like cholera that have important you know, elements within oceans, and certainly they must have their own diversity of viruses that are affecting them. Obviously, we know about some of those. Uh, I mean, one of the interesting features of this, and I didn't talk too much about it, I go into a lot of detail on it in the book, is what I call the taxonomic transmission rule. Basically, what we find is that the probability of transmission of a virus between two organisms is at least in some way loosely related to the phylogenetic relatedness of those organisms. So two hosts that are closely related are going to be able, are, on average, are going to be able to share more of their diversity of microorganisms. So we've never documented a plant virus or a fungal virus that's been able to cross over into mammals or humans, certainly not a bacterial virus. And you know, even within vertebrates, while there's certainly some striking examples of sort of um, bird viruses, influenza being a notable example that come into humans, the probability of transmission really gets more and more important as you get closer to us. So you know, if I was going to look in marine systems, I'd be fo focused a little bit more on marine mammals. Uh, and I think they're really interesting models. And some of our colleagues uh, sort of on the, the wildlife side probably have a lot more to say about this. But at the end of the day, they're sort of um, I wouldn't necessarily imagine that, they, that that would be one of the ultimate vital reservoirs for us as a human population. Um, certainly, we know of no major disease of human history that's emerged from sort of a marine mammal. But it, I mean, it's not, certainly theoretically not impossible, but just probably not one of those places we'd look to first. Hi, Nathan. Jim Conway from Pediatric Infectious Disease. Uh, very impressive work, especially in light of the number of beers we had on the terrace last night. <laughs> um, I'm a, 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 in vaccine preventable disease, um, largely in systems and, and policy. And one of the things that we always have to take into consideration is that for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And we have a number of examples in vaccine preventable disease where introduction of programs actually leads to unexpected consequences. The introduction of rubella vaccine yep. in Russia actually leading to increased cases of congenital rubella because wild type disease was eradicated. The increasing rates of shingles in the United States as we got rid of wild type varicella in children no longer yeah. priming people's immune system. The natural reaction to your work is to say we need to shut off these interfaces and try to prevent the spread of these viruses into the human population. But you have to think that hmm. as you alluded to, over time, there's been a protective effect of having a largely immunized population by their constant exposure. Uh, and we certainly see that with malaria in, in populations that are constantly exposed that have some baseline immunity. Right. In your 
colleagues' interventions where they're going to sort of start this process of, okay, let's shut this down, yep. you start to then create a reservoir of people that are actually susceptible and still at that interface mm -hmm. and potentially actually play into the hands of pandemic development. And I just wonder sort of what your thoughts are, what your plans are in thinking about ways of sort of addressing population immunity as you start to make interventions and in that gray zone of transition. Yeah, I mean, it's a really interesting question. I thought, I thought you might actually go in a slight, even a slightly sort of different direction. I, I think it's a very interesting issue. Um, there's a couple of benefits to what you're talking about as well, which is the fewer situations you have of cross-species transmission, the more likely you're going to be able to identify them when they occur. So they become really things you can monitor more regularly. Um, but there is even sort of a deeper question that goes one step beyond that, which is the reality is, I've told you we understand very little about the diversity of microorganisms. And really, I do believe this. The reason why we're focused on sort of uh, the deadly ones is a little bit like the drunk looking for their keys under the, you know, under the, the lamppost. Like basically, those are the ones we see, obviously, and we focus on them, even though most of them are certainly neutral. And some of them may actually be beneficial. You know, you refer to preventing future pandemics or sort of localized immunization that can sort of provi provide a buffer, perhaps. Um, I think it's interesting to think about, you know, for, I, I think we can address that issue. I think the, the deeper issue is if you look at this work in 50 years, if we really shut down this interface, might we be in a world where we've developed science where, which talks about some of the benefits of some of these microbes flowing into human populations? Now, that's a little bit like science fiction at the moment, but certainly we should think about this as we do these engineering programs. I mean, what I know at this moment is, um, you know, we need to be much more prepared at catching these things. You know, I think the prevention is stuff that we're starting. You know, sadly, I think we're not necessarily going to, you know, if we get that successful where those questions really become important, we've done an amazing job. You know, for now, it's really more about watching the process of how these things come over and catching them early so that we can respond to them. I mean, certainly, um, HIV is, is an interesting model because it's one of these things that crossed over. We should have caught it. We didn't catch it. There's easy ways that we could put up systems to catch something like it that happened in the future. But if we think HIV was sort of alone in its capacity to really have an impact on the human population, we're totally delusional. If we think about this, fine, maybe not in the short term, but in the midterm and the long term over decades, the probability that we're not going to have a major event that's more catastrophic than HIV for our planet to me seems very, very remote. You know, so it's there is sort of this imperative to be thinking about these things, but I think it's a very provocative question and, and certainly interesting to think about in a couple different ways. One other thing I'll mention is that we are actively working with some, um, some vaccinologists to think about ways of using these repositories for vaccines. Like, I mean, in some ways, what we're doing as humans um, is we're creating our own viral ecology. So when you, most people, we think about these vaccines, we see them as human things, so it's human technology. The vast majority of vaccines are just barely a step away from a natural virus. Many of them are living viruses. Okay, basically what we're doing is we're replacing natural viral diversity with artificial controlled viral diversity, whether it's like an attenuated virus vaccine, i.e. just a virus, you know, it, it inactivated, basically still a virus, or parts of viruses, which every, every vaccine we look at is basically just taking bits of viruses. And so what we're doing is we're replacing the natural ones with our artificial ones. The question is how do we create a much more rich assemblage of these things so that we control what we have? I think we're just probably moving into a situation where we engine, you know, really the study of vaccinology, you could think of it in a flipped way, which is really what it is, is work in artificial viral ecology. Um, and we don't think of it that way, but I think it's sort of a healthy way to think of it. So it's probably more replacement, just like controlling what's out there. Great. Oh, okay, this will be the last question. You guys must have had beer last night, too. <laughs> Thanks for letting me ask my question. Uh, I'm Colin Tim. I'm a student in John Yin's systems biology lab upstairs. This is hard to talk in front of a bunch of people. Good job. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, so I'm interested in the, the jumps that you were able to document, I guess. What, what is it to have a jump? What do you see? And then what do you do with those jumps once you find them? Yeah, so... I mean, really what you want to do is, you want, uh, in a very pragmatic way, we think to ourselves, what are the tissues out there that people could, you know, be where we could find a novel agent, okay? And then there's two ways of doing it. One is you just go out and you sample healthy populations. That's what we did in these hunter studies. We went out and we found really exposed people. 
and we took as, you know, as many samples as we could, we could appropriately take from these populations. And then what we do is we screen local animals and we screen through the specimens and actually just look for things. The other things we do is actually look for disease states. And this can be a whole range of things. It can be a number of people that die of an outbreak, for example. This is how we recently have discovered a new virus that we'll be reporting in the next six or eight months. Completely new virus, where it was people that died of an outbreak. And basically, we went into this outbreak and we screened for all the usual suspects. Is it, it looked like Ebola. I mean, this was hemorrhagic fever disease. Is it Ebola? No. Is it Marburg? No. Is it yellow fever? No. Is it typhoid or salmonella? You just go through the list. And once you determine that it's not any of the usual suspects, then you start banging away on these specimens and see what you can find, and then see if it's in many of these individuals. Now, for, that, for those classes where actually you're looking at disease states, whether it's looking for new viruses in range of tumor specimens, or trying to find, say, new cancer viruses, or looking at uh, some sort of hemorrhagic fever disease of unknown origin, like I was just describing, those are pretty straightforward. If we see the right epidemiological pattern, we can link it to a disease. For the healthy people study, like these, where we found these novel retroviruses, then it's a little bit more challenging. What you have to do is you go back into these populations where you have infected individuals, and you set up long-term monitoring studies. And you collect all sorts of different uh, tissues, look for viral load in the different tissues, look for transmissibility, so people who have contact with that individual, do they have the same virus, is it exactly identical, which would lead us to, to, you know, basically would lead us to understand that it crossed from individual to individual, and does it cause disease? So those are harder, uh, and it's basically just long-term monitoring, and one of the challenge, and we have the, all these new retroviruses, um, everyone who we were able to sort of keep in follow-up were monitoring, you know, for people who agreed to be part of these studies to see if they have disease, but the problem is, HCLV1, well, first of all, look at HIV, it takes a number of years after infection to get illness. HCLV1 and HCLV2, it's the same thing, but not only do you have that, but you have compounded on top of that is the fact that a certain percentage of people will live their whole lives with HCLV1 and HCLV2 and not become ill. So if you have a couple of dozen individuals, sometimes it's very difficult to conclude exactly what's going on with them. So in those cases, we focus a little bit more on transmissibility. And to be honest with you, I'm much more concerned with transmissibility than I am with disease. Um, I'm much less afraid of a, a virus like Ebola Okay, which is hugely deadly, very sexy virus, everyone wants to study Ebola, but basically it doesn't transmit very effectively. When I see it transmitting effectively, I'll get scared, but even there, very idiosyncratic symptoms, very quick transmission, like you, you, could, you would see it spreading. Okay? Something like H1N1, which everyone blows off, bizarrely to me, H1N1 was fireworks when it comes to biology. I mean, this is a virus that went from infecting zero people on the planet to infecting like 10% of the human population. You know, that's bizarrely amazing for transmissibility. The thing picks up a couple of crazy genes from H5. It, you know, mutates in a particular way that allows it to, you know, that creates a disease state. Now you're talking about real danger. So, I, so it, it's counterintuitive, but from my perspective, I'm much more fearful personally of transmissibility than disease per se. I mean, you have to have some disease, but you know, a lot of these things are silent killers. Look at HPV, for example. I mean, HPV is hugely, hugely transmissible. It's not particularly deadly, right? So whatever, a third of us in this room probably have HPV, okay? And for only a small percentage, well, I guess now, fortunately, there's a vaccine, but uh, at least for, the, for a couple of the deadly forms. But most people it won't affect, but still, it's so transmissible that even if it causes disease in a very small percentage of individuals, it could be hugely devastating. I mean, the impact of HPV on human health is amazing. It's really, really dramatic. So, um, and transmissibility is easier to monitor. I mean, it's much easier to see. You basically look around and you, how many people are getting it. We set up these really high-risk cohorts. So, for example, in Sub-Saharan Africa, we look for people that have been multiply transfused. So you can find uh, sickle cell patients that reach, so, you know, sickle cell is very common in some of these areas, and sickle cell patients that reach, say, 25, 30 years of age have received hundreds of transfusions during their lifetime, and they can become sort of a sentinel, just like injection drug users can be, of things that are circulating in the blood supply. And so it's blood banks and, and certain kinds of sentinel populations to see if these things are spreading, at least the blood-borne ones. But, you know, we're still developing it. It's a great question. Um, and maybe I've taken us to the end there. That's great. So Nathan, I just want to thank you extremely uh, from the bottom of my heart for coming to, <laughs> to kick off our uh, Institute for Sustainable Global Health and be our 
first major speaker in, in collaboration with the big learning event. And I also look around the room and I'm looking at uh, over 250 people standing room only uh, coming out here to, to come to this talk at one of the, the most dead times of our university uh, as far as the schedule goes. How many of you are, are students here? Wow. And how many of you are students from the vet school? All right, good. And uh, that's, that's, that's the only question I'll ask you. But, <laughs> but again, I really appreciate all of you for uh, coming out here on a, another record hot day and uh, coming to listen to Nathan. And Nathan, thank you very much for making the journey. My pleasure. Thank you.